Like we go live on Facebook. People get to join in right now. It's nothing crazy. Oh, uh, this is why we study. Because we don't want Jesus to make this face at us. Um, it says when the Bible is used straight out of context, and it's Jesus like, dang it. Jesus is like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so this is why we study. A um, couple things before we jump in. I don't know if you notice um, the selection of songs that we sing. Um, but they are, there we go. Um, so when it comes to choosing music, and like when I'm choosing music or if Nani is choosing music, um, when it comes to song selection and song choice, I am very adamant about singing songs to Jesus, songs about Jesus, um, because as we learned in Romans 1, uh, the gospel is the power of salvation. So, if we get here and we only sing songs about us and like, oh, you know, like, I mean, like nothing against like Christian music that is just like my testimony story. There is a time and a place for that. Um, but I am a firm believer that what we do corporately affects how much Jesus will show up. So if we show up and we're singing to Jesus about what he has done for us from our perspective only and we never just say Jesus you are the name above every other name um, then we miss the point and so I'm trying to get Jesus in the building every single Sunday and the quickest way to get Jesus into the building is to tell him how awesome he is and to sing about what he has done for us so a song like King of Kings is literally the gospel and the gospel is the power of salvation so this has like nothing to do with the chapter but like when we do that for people who come to oasis and they're like oh yeah i'll go to your church sure like i'll sit there i go because we sing the songs that we sing jesus is going to show up and affect change in their lives regardless of what i say that makes sense because the gospel is the power of salvation, Romans 1, verse 16. Um, so yeah, that is why we choose the songs that we choose. Um, yeah, there are a lot of good, feel-good Christian songs out there, and that is what K-Love is for, to keep you going through the week. But I'm like, if you want Jesus to show up, then you need to talk to him about what he has done and how powerful and amazing he is, and then he'll show up. Um, and we'll look at that when we go into how to worship a king and the tabernacle at the end of the year. Crazy. Okay, Romans 10. Um, in looking at this, we are in the middle of one continuous thought. So going back to Romans as a whole, it is a letter. Paul did not write Romans as a book of the Bible. Paul wrote Romans to a church to help them understand what's actually happening in Christianity. So when we broke this up, we human beings that are not Paul, when we saw this letter and we said, oh, let's make it a little more easier to read. Unfortunately, the person reading this letter was like, mm, context doesn't mean anything. Let me just put some numbers so you know what you're reading or what you can reference um, quicker. But when you read chapter eight, or like I would say midway through chapter eight, all the way through to chapter 11, it's pretty much one big thought. And so again, because my thought process and what I wanna do through this process is to teach us how to study the Bible is going to do what it's going to do because the Bible is alive, it is living, it is breathing. So because we're going to learn and find things that help our lives anyway, I want to focus on study. So I'm pointing this out right now. When we read chapter nine, chapter 10, and chapter 11, it is one 
continuous thought from God's sovereign choice and why he chose the Israelites and so on and so forth. And then we ended last week talking about, um, oh, talking about the cornerstone and like all the things like Israel's unbelief. It says it right there. Great verse right there. Israel's unbelief. So he's like, God chose them. They still didn't believe. And then we still go into this idea. He's furthering his point in chapter 10. And then he continues to further his point in chapter 11. So because we all have keyword study Bibles, you can look at the headers of all of these sections and you just go, oh, God's sovereign choice, Israel's unbelief, the message of salvation to all. Chapter 11 has the remnant of Israel and the Gentiles are grafted in and then the mystery of Israel's salvation. All of these things are essentially like one part, one idea of the letter. That makes sense. So when we read chapter 10 this week, um, I mean, there are always nuggets because the Bible is the Bible. So there are always going to be nuggets. Um, but this is a good week to understand that there's a bigger picture and a bigger idea that he is pu pushing in this chapter through 9, 10 and 11. So chapter 10, let's jump in. Let's jump in to chapter 10. I'm black, so I say 10. Yeah, 10. It's a thing. Yeah. Like I say like T-I-N for the number T-E-N. So, dang, you black too, Marissa. That's what's up. 10. See, look at us. Look at all of us. All these black people in here. <laughs> Boom. That's all. We got a black church. How do you know this? We all say 10. All of us. 10. 10. I know. 10. Yeah, you do. You feel pretentious, you know? Well, the light bulb, light. Yeah. A lot. A lot. A lot. A lot of what? <laughs> it's a lot bulb. It's a lot of what? Okay. Chapter 10 or 10, depending on your heart's desire. So verse one, he says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So again, we said last week, starting chapter 10 is going to seem a little weird because chapter 10 is still continuing what he was saying at the end of chapter nine. So for this to make sense, we have to go back and revisit chapter nine. So going back to chapter nine, verse 30, he says, what shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were based on the but as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And then he continues, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That makes a lot more sense when you go back and you read it in context. The importance of reading in context. Oh my gosh. The, I cannot say that enough. The importance of reading in context, like the meme said, this is Jesus rubbing his head, freaking out when we are quoting scripture or taking scripture out of context. In context, it makes so much more sense. And in context, there are verses that as Christians, we use all the time to make a point. But when you read it in context, that's not even what it's saying. 
And this is why I love Bible study, because then you can understand what people are trying to do to you or what they're trying to do to others when they're like, well, you know, the scripture says boom, 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 boom. But when you go and reread it in context, you're like, that's not at all what it says. And so <laughs> little preaching tangent real fast. And I promise we're going to get back. So Jesus says in John chapter eight that those who believed in him, he says to those who believe in him, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Two part here. That is a scripture that people use all the time, way out of context. Truth to set you free. Truth to set you free. People say it all the time. Truth to set you free. And I go, that is true to an extent. It is not true in like, you need to like tell people everything about yourself all the time because you will then be free. That's not what that means. Go ahead. Or your version of the truth. Right. Or your version of the truth. So one, because we know and understand what belief is, confiding belief in the truth, my faith. Jesus says to those who believe in him, you will know the truth. And that truth is the same truth that is in John 14 when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. So Jesus says, you will know the truth, me and the truth. Me will set you free. So then because we don't know, because John chapter one, in the beginning was the word, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I will know the truth and the truth will set me free. Context is everything, everything. Context is everything. And this is why we don't just study on a Sunday morning, but this is why we teach how to study on a Sunday morning. So Paul here is saying, yo, the Israelites in this whole book is all about this. You have the Israelites or the Jews who have come to Jesus and they accept him, but they want to hold on to Jewish traditions. And that's why this book is written. The Jews left the church. The Gentiles took it over. It was a mixed church. Jews got kicked out. They came back. Gentiles were like, yo, we're doing all this stuff now because we love Jesus. He set us free. And the Jews are like, mm, no, you need to be circumcised and this and that. And don't eat this. Don't do this. This is what the law says. And that's how you become a good Christian. They were fighting so much. Paul writes this letter and he's still talking about the same thing. This whole letter is about salvation in Jesus and Jesus alone. Nothing else matters. Stop fighting. That's it. So he's just making the point here that the Israelites for so long were striving to do the law and they were missing the righteousness of God because they were only trying to do the law. And then he says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for them, for them is that they may be saved. I actually want them to get it because for so long they've been trying to do, do, do and do. He says it in champion. There's nothing left to prove. And Paul says, I wish myself that I and or he says it further in the chapter. But he goes, I want nothing more for them than to be saved and to know what real relationship with our father is like. That's a that's a prayer. That's one of those like, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours type of prayers. Because I know how good Jesus is to me and not on a like, yeah, everything in my life is so great. No, my perspective has changed and I am not as stressed as I was. And I need people to get this because like Jesus is legit. It's like when you get a really good pair of shoes and you're like, yo, <laughs> You need to get these shoes. You're walking on clouds. It's amazing. I was at Six Flags. Six hours, feet didn't even hurt. You need these shoes. It's the exact same with Jesus. And I go, but what we don't get to, unfortunately, in churches for most of the time, we don't actually get to Jesus. We get to church. And so then we don't want other people to have church because like church is burning me out. 
But when I get Jesus, I have this, it's more than that. And that's what Paul knows and has experienced. And he's saying, I want this for my brothers. I want this for my bloodline. I want this for all of them. They were chosen and they were just doing the law to to get this righteousness. And that's not how it works, guys. He says, I wish that I could like just get them to see and feel that. He says, verse four, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And there that word is again, believes 4100. We see it all the time. Belief belief, faith, believes, whatever version of the word, we see it all the time. And it is confiding belief in the truth. I am firmly persuaded. I believe something else. And then Jesus came along and persuaded me to now believe in him. And that is what Jesus came to do. So then verse five, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm going to read that in the Passion Translation so we can get a little bit of understanding and then we'll go back and like break some words down. So Passion Translation, Romans 10, verse 5, it says, Moses wrote long ago about the need to obey every part of the law in order to be declared right with God. This is also why you have multiple versions of the scripture because they will say them differently. I had a guy at work the other day was like, uh, that's the King James version. I was like, um, it says ESV right there. That's not, he's like, well, that's a, that's a, I said, no, you're no, like, I know my Bible a little bit. And the fact that I like do like, it was a thing for a little bit. I was like, Jesus, don't make me fight him over scripture, please at work. Like so many things wrong with that on so many levels. One, he's bigger than me. I'm a, I'm a lose. Anyway, have a different translation of the scripture. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? I was like, Jesus, you know, he's like, oh, <laughs> you know, just too many levels to, you know, get red X's on. So Moses wrote long ago about the need to obey every part of the law in order to be declared right with God. The one who obeys these things must always live by them. But we receive the faith righteousness that speaks an entirely different message. Don't for a moment think you need to climb into the heavens to find the Messiah and bring him down or to descend into the underworld to bring him up from the dead. Verse eight. But the faith righteousness we receive speaks to us in these words of Moses. God's living message is very close to you, as close as your own heart beating in your chest and as near as the tongue in your mouth. And what is God's living message? It is the revelation of faith for salvation, which is the message that we preach. For if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will experience salvation. The heart that believes in him receives the gift of the righteousness of God. And then the mouth confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scriptures encourage us with these words. Everyone who believes in him will never be disappointed. Verse 12, he says, so then faith eliminates the distinction between Jew and non-Jew, for he is the same Lord of all people, and he has enough treasures to lavish generously upon all who call on him. And it is true. 
Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be rescued and experience new life. That make a lot more sense in English. Granted, it was English, but like it's English, you know. OK, so let's jump into some scripture real quick into some breakdowns. Um, where was the one that I wanted to do? Oh, let's revisit heart. Verse eight. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is a very huge word to understand what it means when it comes to studying scripture and my relationship with Jesus. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to sanctification, when it comes to all of this, I need to understand this word heart. So let's flip to the back. It is number 2588. Number 2588. And that is on page 2164. 2164. My head is itching a little bit. 2164 is the page, and it's on the right side of the page. So, everybody see it? 2588? Okay. <laughs> Cardia, prolonged from a primary car, heart, the heart, i.e. figurative, the thoughts or feelings, in parentheses it says the mind, also by analogy, the middle. So it says plus, or like in the middle, plus something. So enrage, heart, mind. And then it says a noun meaning heart, the seat and center of circulation and therefore of human life. In the New Testament though, it is only used figuratively. So this is huge to know and understand. It's only used figuratively, this version of this word in the New Testament. So it's not like your physical beating heart of blood. Like, it's not that. So number one, or the Roman numeral one, it says, as the seat of the desires, feelings, affections, passions, impulses, i.e. the heart or mind. As the seat of the desires, feelings, affections, passions, impulses, i.e. the heart or mind. So when we look at these letters, A, B, and C, all of these breakdowns are going to lead us back to this overarching definition. My passions, my desires, my feelings, my affections, my impulses. So A says generally just used as the heart. You know, the heart is deceitful. This is why people quote that all the time, but they also forget like Jesus came to sanctify us. And so when you're like, yeah, I just listen to my heart. And they're like, well, the heart is deceitful of all things. Well, also Jesus came to redeem my heart. And says, as I do this, it cleanses my heart. Sanctification, anybody? Like, I am perfect now, but like becoming perfect in him every day, is that not a thing, you know? Like, well, duh, I see why I don't trust my heart outside of Jesus. But if I know every day I'm putting my heart before him, then he's washing that and cleansing that so I can trust the conversations that I have with Jesus in regards to the seat of my desires and feelings and affections and passions and impulses. B, in phrases as out of or from the heart, meaning willingly. And then there are the scripture references with the whole heart, scripture references of one heart and soul, i.e. entire unanimity. Nope. <laughs> Y'all see it. I'm like, I don't even have the brain space to slow down to break it down. I can't. 
Well, I, that's why I said what page it was on, because everybody has, they got study Bibles. So if y'all watching this, you should have this study Bible and you see it right there. I don't have time. Okay, so letter C, used for the person himself in cases where values, affections, or passions are attributed to the heart or mind. And when we look at these scriptures, we see Romans chapter 10, verse 6. So this is what Paul is talking about this whole time. He's using this version. Used for the person himself in cases where values, affections, or passions are attributed to the heart or mind. That makes sense? So when we flip back to Romans... And he's saying we, you know, the Israelites lived by this in their heart. They were striving for in their heart. They were trying to do in their heart. They meant well, he says their affections, their desires was for righteousness. They were just trying to do it through the law. Unfortunately, so he says their hearts were in the right place. Unfortunately, their method was not. Yes, they were given the law, and we talked about the law, chapter 6, or whatever it was, 5, 6, 7. We talked about the law, and how the law is not bad within itself, but that the law does help me, or not help me, but like, the law allows me to sin more, because I know what the rules are, so don't think of a pink elephant, now I'm thinking of a pink elephant. Don't covet your brother's belongings, now I want his Fancy new lawnmower, which back then it was just like scissors, I guess. It's like, dang, you got new scissors? Like, what? Huh? It was a goat. Yeah, it's like, dang, that goat is fast. Like, <laughs> I want that goat, you know? This is fast. So anyway, heart. Understanding the word heart. Because that is what is cleansed every day. That is what lies in the balance. When we get to Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is what is renewed. I think we can flip right there. Let's see if it's in there. Ooh, it's a different word. It's a different number than 2588. That's going to be good when we get there. Sorry. Which I have. Yeah. Anyway, we're jumping ahead. But that's what is renewed. That is what is changed in me. My desires, my affections, my impulses. So my impulses go from negative things to things of God. My desires legitimately become his desires. My affections legitimately become his affections. That's crazy. That's really good. And that's when you know you've changed when you're like, oh, snap. I don't even want to do this. I feel bad for them that they mad at me and I'm legitimately trying to figure out how to make this better. Jesus is changing me. You telling me they mad at me and I know they wrong and I don't even want to go off. Okay, Jesus is changing my desires and my affections. Heart. Okay, verse nine. And we all know this verse, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe there it is again in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Justification again. The moment that I come to Jesus and I say, I believe I confess it. And I believe is the moment that the slate is wiped clean. It is now my job to stay in the blood so that I stay justified every day, every moment. You're not going to be perfect, but that's what Jesus died for. He says, I know you're not going to be perfect, but you are justified right now in me. God sees you, deems you as righteous. And I always say this. The justification happens the one time, but continue to confess and believe. I'm not going to go into the whole like, 
once saved, always saved. That's a ridiculous argument to go into anyway. Just tell people to believe in Jesus. Like, why do like the idea of am I saved forever or not? Tries to get me out of my responsibility of doing the things that I said I would do when I come to Jesus. Because now I'm trying to justify my behavior outside of Jesus because I need to know if I'm saved forever or not. But if I just step into Jesus like I know I need to, that's not even a concern of mine. You know what I'm saying? I don't look at Jenny and I'm like, oh, well, if I do these things, we'll be married forever. No, I just focus on the relationship. We've all been there where you like take your ring off to do something. And then next thing you know, as a matter of fact, our anniversary, we in Walmart. I have no ring on and she forgot her band. She just had on her engagement ring. And I go once saved, always saved. That's a moment where we'd be like, That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Sorry. I mean, I forgot mine. So I was just like, you know, sorry. My bad. Was not my intent at all. Not my intent. Not one bit. Not one bit. Not what I meant to say or imply at all. No. But I go, if you forget your ring, you're not all of a sudden walking around going, am I married? Am I not? Am I? What? No. No, you just focus on the relationship. And again, we have entire camps of people who will start a church or leave a church or end a church or whatever because of how people see that. Well, I confess the one time I'm just going to say this. If you focus on the relationship, guess what? You will find yourself confessing and believing every moment of every day. Because I love Jenny, guess what? Sometimes she walks past the TV and I'm like, man, I'm so in love with her. And I say it again, out loud. <laughs> Sometimes she walks past the TV and y'all thought I was always gonna say this the first time, but I just watch because she walked past the TV. <laughs> and I admire her for who she is and what she looks like. Let's just be honest, you know? But I go, I'm not sitting there. Are we? Aren't we? Like, can I? No. If I just focus on the confess and the believe part and what this relationship looks like and what it's hap what's happening in me as I dive into this relationship. Once saved, always saved or not doesn't even matter. Because I know I'm saved every single day. Because I'm always doing this relationship with Jesus. If I'm standing in the blood, guess what? I'm saved. That's crazy. So if people bring that up to you, well, what do you think? Can someone just focus on the relationship? That's what matters. Can, well, what if just focus on Jesus and that's all that matters? Well, what if this? If you just live the gospel... It is the power of salvation. That's all I want to do every day. Live the gospel. And you can throw as many what ifs out there, but I know for a fact, if you focus on Jesus, you are going to have a life change and you will be saved. And that's what matters. Not how can I get out of this? Like, where's the line so I can like skirt it just enough? No, focus on the good of Jesus and the relationship with him. He says, you are justified, verse 10, the one who believes is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Let's look at this word confesses, 3670. I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea what it means. It could just be confesses. It's a good one. Um, Allison like took notes, like two pages of notes and she did not, she didn't. Oh, four pages. Sorry. Oh, they're, they're, they're typed. typed. Oh, I'm a nerd. 3670 is what we're looking up. I was like, you should be up here because I sent that text out and I was like, oh, I should read this in two versions. And that's what I did. <laughs> like, I read it in two versions because the pastor said we should. So here we are. Allison took notes and stuff. 
you know, huh? That's fine. You, that's fine. You read ahead, you know? So 3670 on page 2218. Confess? Confess. Yeah. Confess is the word. 3670. Homologio. I speak Greek, nothing crazy. From a compound of the base of 3674 and 3056, which is always good to see that, and then you're like, oh, well, let me see what those words are. Then you can go back and you're like, okay, I see how we got this compound word. To assent, i.e. covenant or acknowledge. To acknowledge, make confession or confess. To declare, grant, profess, or promise. From homo logos, assenting, which is from homo, u, homo, u, together with and logos, word. To speak or say the same with another. To say the same things, i.e. to assent, accord, to agree with. This already paints a different picture of what we know confession is. That's tight. This is why I love word study. So already to speak or say the same with another, to say the same things, to assent, accord, or to agree with. That means I'm not just saying, oh yes, Jesus is Lord. I am actually saying I stand with the fact that Jesus is Lord. And because of that, he is now Lord of me. More than just, I believe in Jesus. That's tight. You were right. This is huge. So number one, Roman numeral one, to concede, admit, or confess of sins. And we have the scripture references there. Hence, to confess publicly, acknowledge openly, or profess. And we'll see here Romans 10 verse 9. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is, is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It says followed by N or N to confess Christ personally, meaning to profess or acknowledge him. Scripture references followed by reference to a person to acknowledge in honor of someone, i.e. to give thanks or to praise. And then Roman numeral two to be in accord with someone or to promise. So when I confess more than the action itself, because it does include the action, yes, I have to say this out loud to one person, two people, 76, 80,000, whatever. This is why it works to confess all the time. Man, that's good. To tell people I am standing with the truth of who Jesus is. Yes, I believe in him, but my confiding belief in the truth also says this. That is what confession is. That's tight. It's not just me saying it. It's an actual life change. It is a mental, it's a paradigm shift. It's a perspective shift of how I see Jesus when I say that he is Jesus. That makes sense? Yeah, that's good. So in my heart, in my affections and my desires and my impulses, I believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and my sin always is going to come from my seat of desires. So this is where I believe Jesus and who he says he is and that he died for every sin nature thing that comes out of me. I believe that he'd redeem that. And now, because I believe that he redeemed that, I will say out loud that I believe in him. And I stand with the fact that he is Lord of all. I stand with the fact that nothing can come against him. I stand with the fact that his blood covers me every day as long as I choose to be covered in his blood. I am who you say I am. I am. Confess when I say I believe in Jesus, 
I am saying I believe that I am who you say I am. This is heavy stuff, man. This is like for real, for real life changing, like, oh, snap, let's do this then. at the end of this verse and how it says like you will be saved and I'm mm -hmm. like, of, like this passage as like do you do this to do this to get this yes instead of like I like God is just like showing me right now like you'll be saved from your own yes shit like, from <laughs> your own self yes <laughs> it's the truth <laughs> like, yeah. it's the truth y'all heard she said <laughs> okay and I'm like, yeah, like my heart is breaking because I'm just like, always look at this as like, you have to do this to get this. Mm -hmm. Instead of like, you do this and then you get this. Like, right. Like you get to be free, like not like saved only from damnation, but right. saved from like your next Your life. own self. Yes. Yeah. And you get to be saved into like a beautiful life. Yes. <laughs> like that's crazy. It is crazy. And it's people walking around. Yes, I love Jesus. And they miss this part. So then they don't treat people how Jesus wants them to treat people. Because I go that revelation right there says, oh, all I have to do is believe and I am saved from myself. If I'm just saved from myself, there's a lot of things that naturally I'm not even going to do. I'm not going to down talk myself because I'm saved from that. Jesus redeemed the smallest parts, which are literally the biggest parts of me. My own mind, my, my desires, my affections, my impulses. I am not just saved from hell forever. No, I am saved from having to live a life of guilt from the life that I was living. And all of it is given freely. That's tight. Jesus is tight. I don't know if y'all knew that, but he is. Verse 14, let's move forward. Verse 14, he says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How can they call on somebody they don't even believe in, the Israelites? And how are they to believe in him? of whom they have never heard. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. There's another verse that we hear all the time. And I go that verse specifically, and we'll read it in the passion because it's just easier to understand. And then I'll make, I'll say what the, you know, I'll walk us through that. Verse 14, it says, but how can people call on him for help if they've not yet believed? And how can they believe in one they've not yet heard of? And how can they hear the message of life if there is no one there to proclaim it? And how can the message be proclaimed if messengers have yet to be sent? That's why the scriptures say, how welcome is the arrival of those proclaiming the joyful news of peace and of good things to come. But not everyone welcomes the good news, as Isaiah said. Lord, is there anyone who hears and believes our message? Faith then is birthed in a heart that responds to God's anointed utterance of the anointed one. Faith then is birthed in a heart that responds to God's anointed utterance of the anointed one. Verse 17 in the ESV. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ in the Passion translation. Faith then is birthed in a heart that responds to God's anointed utterance of the anointed one. So here's the deal. God made all of us, every human being on earth. Pick the worst person you know, created by God. Boom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, shoot is right. So the worst person you know created is created by God, has been. So because 
God has created all of us. He puts in all of us something that longs for him. There's always that something and people call it, oh, my intuition, my heart, whatever they want to call it, they label it. I go, it's your spirit, man, that was created by God that is longing for him. He is always the missing piece. And so when that spirit man through the Holy Spirit is not connected to God, what do I do? I watch Netflix. I try to watch YouTube. I'm on Facebook. I eat. I stress out. I clean. I whatever it is. And I'm naming the good things that everybody says is acceptable to do. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because obviously Christians are like, well, I, I don't do drugs. Like, OK, <laughs> well, I'm not out murdering people, you know, like, well, you also stress eat. So there's that. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it's this, it is. It's the same. So I go, he says, how will they know? How will they hear? How will they get in touch if nobody's doing it or preaching it or saying it? And preaching is not just up here from a pulpit because you have to live your everyday life, which is why you confess out loud. So then those around you can hear. And what you say will connect with their spirit man that they don't realize is in them. So then their faith will come by hearing you. And they're hearing what will they hear? The word of God. The gospel. Because I'm confessing the gospel. That makes sense. There's a part of me that is already looking for it. There's a part of me who's already looking for it. I just have to get in the right place with the right people to hear it. And that is where faith will come in. So like I said earlier, why do we sing the songs we sing about Jesus and the gospel, him dying on the cross, him conquering sin, him being this intercessor for us forever? Why do we sing those songs? Because before I ever preach anything, they have already heard when somebody shows up and they don't know Jesus, they've already heard the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. That's why song choice is important. We need to sing what the word is. Again, there's nothing wrong with a testimony song. But there is a huge difference between a song of testimony and a song like King of Kings. There's a huge difference. That's why we listen to rap before service <laughs> and after. It's a party now. But I go, when we sing, we're not just going to sing whatever, you know, cupcake Jesus song. We're not doing that. Because I need you to hear the gospel. If you don't know the song, I don't know the words. I don't know how it goes. Sit and listen. And if the song is based in gospel, which is the gospel is the power of salvation. Guess what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If I can hear the word of God, my faith is that much closer in grasp. That's crazy. Yes. Because it just takes away like pressure, mm -hmm. like, obligation. Yeah. Puts power in. Like, mm -hmm. like whether I want that or like whether I know I want that or not. Like, right. My spirit is like here. Really and that is why we do what we do. Because regardless of what Rafer gets up here to say in a sermon, I put everything on Jesus. This is your service. These are your songs. Do what you need to do today in this service. I do my little Kings of Comedy bit at the beginning of service and then I get out the way. <laughs> Jesus is like, you get to pick memes and backgrounds and that's it. I got the rest of this. And I'm like, cool, deal, deal. It does not matter what it looks like. That's why church, talking to a pastor the other day and I'm like, yeah, we're just studying Romans. We're just sitting down at tables, studying and teaching how to study. And he's like, man, I've been at a church that's been here for X amount of years. He's like, you have the advantage of starting fresh. 
I got people who've been at this church forever, man. And I said, I get it. I'm cracking eggs, like mindset. I'm cracking eggs here. I'm like, I get the foundation people. You got to like dig and break some things down. But I go, when I realize that Jesus is all that matters, guess what? I can change a service to look like I want it to look for the sake of getting people to Jesus. I don't care what your traditions are. I don't care how long you've been holding on to them. I know that the gospel is the power of salvation. So it never matters what it looks like. So when people come to Oasis, I've never seen church like that because we just want Jesus. That's why. Churches need you to do this and do that. And it has to look and be. And we got time constraints, yada, yada, yada. We got. I just need you to get Jesus. That's it. I just need you to get to Jesus. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that faith will come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Song choice, scripture, whatever. I had a couple people tell me after the rally, man, you just spoke from scripture. And I was like, what else was I supposed to do? Like, I know that I cannot get up there and convince people to do anything. But what I do know is I can present the word of God to you because that is, again, the gospel is the power unto salvation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Go look at every song that we sing. Go look at every song that we sing. There's a process to this. Every song is a heavy hitter. Why? Because it's the gospel. Every song. Every single song is a heavy hitter and it catches you off guard every week because you're like, oh, we're doing this for real. Yes, we're doing this. Because the gospel is the power of salvation. And if you're walking out of here without Jesus, what it like, if I didn't present Jesus at some point, that's my bad. And that's the one thing that Jesus expects me to do every single week. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Verse 18, and we'll wrap up. But I ask, have they not heard? He's still talking about the Israelites. Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation with a foolish nation. I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Verse 21, but of Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So going back to chapter nine, the stumbling stone, going back to those who were not chosen are the ones who have accepted God, accepted Jesus. So he's writing right now to the Israelites. He's like, you guys, bros, Jewish Christians in the Romans church, you guys had it. Y'all just pushed it away because you didn't want it. And you went through all these things. You were jealous of every nation because they had a king. You had the greatest king and you wanted a man king. And every king, even though whether they were great in God's eyes or not great in God's eyes, they were human beings. You had the greatest king of all time and you didn't want it. So you heard, you understood. And so what does that look like for us today? We're sitting in churches and we're hearing and we're understanding. And we're still missing it. We're still missing it. We're trying to do all the other things. We're trying to do all the things, man. And don't you don't need to do the things focus on on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. He says, but of Israel, verse 21, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. 
Most people would focus on the fact that the Israelites were disobedient and contrary to God and then walk away with Christian guilt. Oh, man, I've just been contrary and disobedient. He says, all day long, I have held out my hands. That's the part I focus on. All day long, I've held out my hands. That speaks more to the character of God than it does about my sinful nature that we already knew was there. The hardest part I have is understanding that God is standing there all day long, hands open. He didn't say I turned my back on them because they were disobedient. He said, no, I stand there all day long. Hands open, arms ready. We know the story of the prodigal son and we talk about the dad. We focus on the son. It's a story about the father. Identify with the father who's running to you. All day long, I stand there with my hands open. Yeah, I know you disobedient. Yes, I know you crazy. Yes, I know. I know they crazy. I know. I gave you them kids. <laughs> I gave you them kids who's standing on the counter looking for medicine and nothing but underwear. I gave that kid to you. I know. That's his conversation with me today. Trey and I got in the car and he, Daddy, I don't want to buckle my seatbelt. I don't want, I don't want to go. Literally, like, I'm in the car. The next thing we're doing is coming here. And I said, stop! And then I had to turn on my Jesus music, because, like, that's why I was, I was in the zone, you know? But before I could even approach Jesus, guess, what, guess who's standing there? Arms wide open. You got to apologize for this one, bro, because you mad and you're not going to go serve my people. And you can't serve your son. So, Jesus, I'm sorry. Because he is making me mad. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do things for you, Lord. And it's hard. And he goes, I know it's hard. I know. I know. Remember to stay in me and the grace will be sufficient. Remember to stay in me and you will, need, you will give him what he needs. Remember to stay in me. Because you're not going to show up at that church today and be mad at him for being a two-year-old. You're not going to do that. Yes, sir. And I go, and God has this way of being so stern and loving at the same time. It's the most gentle stern I have ever felt. Nobody comes close. Yes, sir. I love you, son. I want you more. And then it's like, well, of course. Well, now, I'm, now I feel like an idiot because I was mad at you. And you're like, I want you more, Dad. And I'm like, okay, you over it. And I had to deal with Jesus on that one. Wow. But I go, he's standing there. And if I focus on the fact that I am the disobedient, contrary person, guess what? I'm not letting my heart be renewed. I'm not letting my mind be renewed. I'm falling back into what relationship with people would be like. And God is standing there all day long, hands open. So, huh? Go ahead. We don't have friends that do that. It's okay. It's your spouse. It's okay. And Jenny will tell you, it, I'm working. I'm better than I was. I'm working on it. I am. I'm better than I was, but it's a work in progress. It is a work in progress all the time to be like Jesus. It's no joke. It's hard, but he will grace us through it every single time. If we ask him to stay with us in the moment, he will. Was that your phone? Dang. Dang. Any other questions, comments, concerns? No? Okay, we're going to go into the holy place. Facebook, I love y'all. Y'all have fun. Thank y'all for joining. Um, we'll see y'all on the flip. Stay up.
So I go again, we got a lot of stuff out, of a lot more than I thought we were gonna get out of this, to be honest. Um, but remembering in context, as we read chapter 11 this week and going into next week, um, yeah, as we go into chapter 11, remembering this is all still 9, 10, and 11 is like one big thought. And I would suggest as we go through the week to look at, um, look at what? Oh, the passion translation or the message and then read it like a letter. So like jump into chapter nine or read the end of chapter eight in a modern English version and then read it legitimately as a letter and you'll see so much more in context. So then when we get to chapter 11 next week, we can deep dive so we can get the nuggets. That makes sense? Okay, let's go into the holy place real quick. That's not communion. I was like, that's cool. That's rap. All right, holy place. Let's go.